we have already covered finite difference, finite volume, and today we are starting to talk about finite elements. So why are we studying so many different numerical methods? Because all of them are good or bad for different problems, uh, different reasons. So finite difference we already looked at. It's very good at solving differential equations where we know the solution is smooth, right? Where actually it makes sense to discretize the differential operator as uh, using Taylor series expansions. As opposed to finite volume, it is uh, uh, for finite volume, it is more suited if you have solutions that has discontinuities, and on the discontinuity, it doesn't make any sense to use Taylor series expansion to approximate differential operators. Another difference is that finite difference works better if you have a domain that is completely regular. I mean, the more regular the domain is, the more regular the mesh is, the, the easier time you will have uh, developing these kind of uh, approximations. If you have a completely unstructured domain that is super complex, uh, it'll be very tedious developing all kinds of uh, finite difference operators for different conditions. If you have uh, five neighboring nodes, you have seven neighboring nodes, you have 27 neighboring nodes, uh, it'll be a lot of work to do. Well, in finite volume, we are discretizing the domain into small volumes. As long as you have a partition of space, you can apply the integral form of the differential equation to the partition of space. And uh, as long as you can approximate the flux at the interface between every adjacent pair of small volumes, finite volume is going to work. Right, so, so we'll defer that part of discussion to later this semester because we want to cover all these four methods for you to have a, a, a good basis to choose your own project when, when it comes to the fourth quarter of the semester. So today we are going to be talking about finite element. And uh, a finite element has its unique strengths. So it is, I mean, when we go to finite volume, we can see it is a lot of work to even get to second order accuracy, right? And uh, in finite element, it's actually a lot easier to go higher order. And in, in contrary to finite difference, for finite difference, there's also not a lot of work to go higher order, right? So you just uh, expand your distance and uh, uh, take away more terms in the Taylor series. But another thing about finite element is that it also works for a very complex domain. So, so we'll see how it achieves that much power. And uh, uh, just, a, just a reminder, we can we want to do the same demo uh, we did a little bit before for finite difference, finite element, a uh, finite volume. But today we'll include finite element. So, but like today, I want to do something a little bit different. So, can somebody come up and draw a function that tricks the finite difference? So, this is finite difference discretization. Somebody draw a function that tricks the finite difference discretization to think that the function is completely zero. Okay, we all know what finite difference does, right? So what, what does finite difference do in approximating a function? What does it store? The value of the function at the grid points. So can somebody draw a function that tricks finite difference to think that the function is completely zero? Come on, I know you can do it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good idea, right? Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, we have the function here, right. So, so that's good. So you have drawn a function that is com not really zero over here, but because the non-zero does not occur at any grid point, so finite difference is going to think the function is all zero, because the, all the values it stores are basically zero. Right, so that's a good point. As long as the function passes the grid points when it is zero, the finite difference is going to think it's zero. 
So it's not very difficult to trick finite difference, right? That's also how finite difference would make an error in approximating functions. So now let's go to finite volume. So can somebody draw another function that tricks finite volume to think it is all zero? Would the last function do? Would the function you've drawn trick finite volume to think it's zero? No? All right, so let's uh, draw another function that tricks finite volume to think it is all zero. Okay, pretty good. We have drawn a function that varies pretty wildly over this control volume. But because the average is almost zero, it has a huge positive and also an, a huge negative in the same control volume. So the average is pretty much close to zero. That's what final volume does, right? It only stores the volume averages. So, so this is a way to trick final volume of thinking the function is zero. And this is how final volume can make an error in approximating a function. OK. So let, now let's go to finite element. And uh, we are going to see a little bit of uh, why finite, finite element is uh, uh, does better in approximating functions. So let me first uh, try to uh, draw the function you've drawn right, in finite difference. So it's 0, um, except you have a spike inside the volume, and you get a bunch of zeros. This is actually how one of the finite element methods would approximate this function. Can somebody just uh, take a guess of what this finite element method is doing in approximating the function? It's a little bit difficult to guess, right? Because I've drawn non-zeros only in this element, let's say. But the function is non-zero actually in several elements. So let me just uh, take another one. Let me just uh, draw the, f the second function that tricks the finite volume of thinking. Uh, the function is all zero. So it goes zero over here. I had a huge spike in positive, another huge spike in negative, and come back. All right. Again, the finite element did not treat the function as all zeros. Although inside the volume I have, uh, I averaged out. And this function actually would trick both finite volume and finite difference to think the function is zero, right? because it passes all the grid points almost a zero, and uh, the average is almost all zero. But still, finite element gives me a function that varies. That seems to, seems to know that the function has its, its sloped downwards over here. It has positive on the left and negative on the right. So what is it doing? As if this is not enough, let me, let me try this with another type of finite element is called a, a discontinuous basis finite element. Let me draw the same function here. Uh, it has a positive spike and a negative spike and goes to zeros. This is a different type of finite element method. This is what it does. Right? Uh, it's okay over the volumes over the cells or elements where the function is zero it actually gives me zero but within this element it seems to know that the function is sloped in a downward way okay anybody so far having a look at these examples uh, tell me what finite element does yes guess yes it does an approximation of the function within that cell um, that, well, in this case, which is linear. Um, so it so. does some kind of approximation for some for function over the cell. So the question is, what is that approximation? The answer is the following. Finite element looks at the function and chooses over a small class of functions whatever function within the small class that is as close to the function I draw as possible. Right, so it, it chooses the best approximation to whatever function I draw within a finite set, I shouldn't say finite set, a finite dimensional set of possible functions. So I know this is a very vague answer. So the today's task is for us to basically make what I just said, rigorous. 